In this lesson, we'll look at the five most common mistakes beginners make in Webflow and how we can fix them. The first mistake I see beginners making a lot is applying text color to each individual text element. Not only does this slow down our process, but it also doesn't account for any new text that might be added through JavaScript or something later to our section. Now, text color is an inherited property. That means if we don't apply text color to an element, it will just receive from the nearest parent that has a color applied, just like any other font property, size, line, height, weight. This is why we don't want to apply color directly to our paragraph or heading tags. We always want that to be able to receive from its parent. That means if we attach a text color to the whole section, then any text inside will receive that color by default unless we override it. So we don't need to apply this color to each element. Now, if we ever do want to override the text color, we can of course change it on an individual element, but by default, it will receive from the parent if we don't have anything applied. Anywhere we attach a background image, gradient, or color, we need to also be setting a text color. So if we use the same section in light mode, notice how the text in these cards is no longer legible because we applied a background image but didn't apply a text color to that element. The second most common mistake is forgetting to apply aspect ratios or heights to any images or their parents throughout our site. We found a size applied to the image. When the user's reading this content, the page height changes once the image loads in, and this causes the whole layout to shift, which can reduce our page speed score and break any JavaScript libraries that are relying on the page height. So every image should ideally have an aspect ratio and even a background color, so we have a placeholder while it's loading in. The third common mistake is not using the correct elements and tags when building our site. I've only recently learned this example, but if we have a list of things, like a list of nav links, we should really be using a list element here. Whenever the user tabs on this, they have to tab through each link one by one, whereas whenever they tab on a list, it will tell them how many items are in this list and allow them to skip to the end if they'd like. So if in each list item, that's where we should have our different nav links here. Now, within most style guides, list and list items have a lot of default styles that need to be cleared. We could of course remove the bullets each time and zero out the padding or margin, but that can be pretty tedious. I recommend leaving these list items in list unstyled by default. We can style them when in the rich text if needed, but since list will be used so much throughout our site, it's better to leave all those default styles off so we can apply whatever styles we want freely. The fourth mistake is relying too heavily on children to define sizes and offsets on these items. This is common when coming from a design software and we're used to just dragging things where we want them, but we run out of space pretty quickly on shorter screen heights for all of this content. So what we can do instead is set this child to fill all the remaining space within its parent and then just center within that remaining space. And here we start to have a lot more space on smaller screens for this content because we're embracing the fluidness of the web. The same concept can be applied when setting a size on children. So here, if we set the size on these items to just be where we want, then we'll notice on shorter screen widths, they start to overflow and collide into each other because they really have no context of how much space is available. So what we can do instead is let them fill all the space within their parent, and we can grab the parent and set this to fill all of the space within its parent, and then just give it a max width if we don't want it to go all the way to the edge so that on smaller screen sizes, it will start to shrink the children instead of forcing them to always be that width. The fifth mistake we can solve for is using units in places they're not best suited for. Here we have a font size on this heading set with pixels. That means if the website visitor increases their preferred font size, the heading isn't changing in size at all. If the visitor hasn't touched their preferred size, the browser default is 16 pixels. So we can use a unit called REM instead, if we set this font size to one rem, that's one times the preferred font size, so 16 pixels in this case. If we do two rem, that's two times 16, so this will look like 32 pixels. If we want it to look like 64 pixels, we do 64 divided by 16, and that means our font size should be four rem. So now it looks like 64 pixels, but the visitor can actually adjust that size. And we wanna use a line height here. We could try setting that to rem as well, but if we adjust our font size across breakpoints, that line height won't scale with the font size itself. So we can use a unitless line height instead. If I set one dash here, that's one times whatever the font size is. So right now, this will look like a four rem line height, 
But if I set this to two, then this is two times the font size. This line height will look like eight rim. So we wanna do something similar for letter spacing because right now when we make our font size smaller, those letters are colliding into each other because this letter spacing is set with rim and it's not based on the font size of the element. What we can do instead is go ahead and set this with EM since unit list values aren't an option here. And EM works pretty similar to unit list. If we have basically a, maybe we'll say one EM max width here, that's one times whatever the font size on the element is. So this will be a four rem max width. If we do two EM, that's two times the font size. So this will look like an eight rem max width. So we can really have things based on the font size. And that way, when we adjust this size, the letter spacing will scale up and down. Now, we don't want this heading here to only have one word on this line. So there's CSS properties that we could add like text wrap balance, but currently that's not supported in Firefox and Safari yet. And for important things like this heading, we really wanna control where these words wrap ourselves. Now, if we were to set this max width using rim, we'll run into the same issue we had with our letter spacing where it looks good here, but on other breakpoints where we change the font size is now not wrapping in the place we want anymore. So rim for a text max width really isn't the best idea. We can try something like EM instead. So if I do 12 EM or dial that down to where I want, then we'll notice once we have that line wrap set where we want, it'll always stay consistent even when the font size changes across breakpoints. This is especially great if you're using fluid font sizes where the heading font size might be scaling at a different rate than the max width or other values. This just keeps everything nicely locked in together. And we can upgrade this even a step more by using a unit called CH. And this isn't just based on the font size, but it's based on the width of the character zero within this font. And this is just even a little bit more reliable than EM, because if we change our font across elements, the max width will mostly stay in the same place. If say we switch this to more of a condensed font, it'll take that into account and it's still falling in the right place across breakpoints. So that's a high level overview of how to fix some of the most common mistakes that can be made in Webflow.